Welcome to communion service. And um, I'm going to try to pick up where we left off, or pick up where I left off um, with the theme of standing uh, on Sunday. Uh, was anybody not here? Everybody was here? Good. So you kind of have, but you were listening online, so you kind of got an idea of what we were talking about. Um, and tonight we're going to actually, um, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is where we're going to spend most of our time. So, you know, when you, um, <laughs> when you, when you start studying something, boy, it just leads you down all these different directions and some, some of it can be maybe a little distraction or just a tangent or some of it can be applicable to what you're looking at and, and you end up finding more and more and more and more uh, information and, uh, and then eventually you get to the point where it's like, okay, I, I, I have to cut this off because there's no way I'm going to be able to share all this information. So I can, I can appreciate on Sunday mornings when Pastor Ritz stands up here saying, I am full. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I kind of equate that to trying to put 10 gallons into a five gallon can. Uh, you know, you've got 10 gallons worth of information, but you only got a five gallon can of time to try to put it all in. So uh, that's kind of how I feel tonight. And plus it being communion, we want to leave some time to actually have communion, right? We don't want to just you know, rush it and go right like, the, you know, five till and then, all right, everybody do communion, let's go. You know, so we don't want to do that. So I want to try to get going. And I do want to kind of revisit a little bit what we talked about, remind you a little bit what we were talking about on Sunday uh, before we pick up um, into First Corinthians chapter 10. But as always, uh, it would be best if we bowed our heads one more time and asked the Lord to, to lead and guide us through this study tonight. So we do do that tonight, Lord. We just give it to you. Pray, Lord, that you would just touch us through your word and through your word, Lord, draw us close to you. And then, Lord, we would truly have a wonderful time of fellowship with you at your, at your table, Lord. Uh, we come in here with a multitude of different needs, a multitude of different cares, uh, different desires, uh, requests, Lord. And, and you know them all. And, Lord, you want, to, you want to hear them and you want to touch us through them. And so tonight, as we just spend this time in your word and then just quietly for a moment, just laying all this stuff before you, I would just pray that you would renew that koinonia that we have with you, that, that, uh, that communion that we have with you. And Lord, that we would be drawn near and comforted and, and strengthened, Lord. Strengthen even more, Lord, to be able to and strengthen and resolve to walk even more closely to you throughout this world, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless us now as we turn to your word in your name. Okay, so we uh, started in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, last week, or last Sunday, and we were on that verse where Paul says, watch, be strong in the faith. No, it says, watch, stand fast in the faith, <laughs> be strong, be brave. If you remember, stand fast. That, that was the, what we keyed on, right? Stand fast. And, uh, and he said that uh, as he was in if Ephesus, and he was writing to them, and he said to them that, that a great and effective door was open to him, but there are many adversaries. And, and so he kind of concludes that section with watching, standing fast, being courageous, and being strong. Interesting that he did not say retreat or, boy, I'm tired of all this, advers you know, this, these, these things that are coming against me and this adversity, and, and so I'm going to leave and I'm going to my next body. He said, nope, nope, great door is open to me. Adversaries are here. Stand. We're going to stand and we're going to do what we're called to do. So that's what he, that's what he did. And then we kind of jumped off the word stand there. We went through a whole bunch of different definitions and we landed in Ephesians chapter six on the, the whole armor of God. And we went through each of those, um, each of those sections of, uh, you know, different pieces, the seven pieces of armor that he, uh, encourage us to put on. Uh, and, and so in, in the last couple verses of that section, Ephesians chapter six, or not, actually not the last couple, but I wouldn't say it's the beginning either, but 
let me just say, it's Ephesians chapter 6, chapter, verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. As I was kind of going through the recap and looking at this again, I noticed uh, something that was a little different between those a couple of verses. And the first one, he says, put on the whole armor of God. And then later he says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And I thought, I, you know, I didn't notice that before. And so I looked at it and put on simply means in the original translation means to just put it on. Uh, take up means something completely different. It means use it. Okay? So it's not just simply putting it on. You can put it on and not use it, right? So he's telling them, put it on and use it. Okay? So you have to use your full armor of God. So where Paul admonished to stand fast, fast in the faith, um, in, he says that in, in 1 Corinthians or into the Corinthians and Ephesians, he's saying, having done all to stand. And we said that that means that we're not to be a pushover. We're not to be easily moved. Um, and if we are going to stand, we concluded that it's imperative that we evaluate our defenses, our self fortitude. And we have to ask ourselves in, re in relation to those seven, those seven items, uh, how is my prayer life? And are we satisfied with that? And then the second one, how well do we know uh, the truth of God, right? Because you're girding yourself with truth. How well do we know the truth of God? Uh, and am I committed to it? And the breastplate of righteousness, um, do I have a true righteousness or is it more of a facade of righteousness? Um, and, and then we have to be honest with ourselves and thinking, where, where have I compromised my walk with Jesus in this culture? How well are we prepared to engage the culture with the gospel of peace, or would we rather win an argument? You know, because that's not what we're supposed to do, right? He says, be prepared with the gospel of peace. And then are you confident in your faith, in your eternal hope of heaven in Jesus, or can it be shaken? Because he says, above all, take that shield of faith that you may be able to fend off those fiery darts of the devil, right? That's well. You got to have that because, right? You know, that's going to stop those darts from coming in. And if those darts get by, because you don't have a, a strong faith, they're going to hit you in your breastplate of righteousness. And if that's a fake breastplate of righteousness, that is your fatal spot right there. Right? And it's going to do it's going to do some fatal damage right there, mortal damage to the to the internal organs. Uh, so, how confident are we in our faith? Um, and then we talked about uh, the hell of a salvation, girding up your, the loins of your mind and taking every thought captive and not being carnally minded, but being spiritually minded. Uh, and then how, how much are you committed to knowing and applying God's word to your life? Uh, and that was in, we took a look at Ephesians chapter four, not for Ephesians, Hebrews chapter four there. And, uh, you know, and we also looked at second Timothy two, where he says to, you know, be a, a worker uh, that is um, prepared, I guess, not ashamed, um, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? So you have to be able to use God's word as you engage with, with society, but you're not supposed to hurt people with it, right? You're not, you're not supposed to be, you know, cutting off ears, we said, like Peter did, all right? So that's not what you want to do. But then again, on the other side of that two-edged sword is, you know, where, where does it need to do some cutting and, and repair in my own life? Um, so with that, uh, we are now going to turn to chapter one, I'm sorry, first Corinthians chapter 10 in verse one. And we're going to pick up this, this idea here. And this is going to be a little more tailored towards a, a communion service message. Um, yeah, so let's just start right here. First Corinthians 10 verse one. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate that same spiritual food, all drank that same spiritual drink, for they drank that 
of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Just real quick, log that. Log that, okay? The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We're going to see how that comes back in more and more later here. Nor let them commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let them, and nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. No, all things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Interesting that all are the two songs that Terry played tonight both had the word heed in them. Thought that was interesting. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing with which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The blood which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partaker of the altar? What am I saying then? Is an idol anything or what is offered to idols anything rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to God and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons and you cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy are we stronger than he so in this section uh, Paul is continuing actually a thought from a couple chapters earlier. He's talking about eating meat that was sacrificed to idols at the temple in chapter 8. And obviously there's a much bigger issue that he's trying to get at here rather than just, is it okay to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols in the temple? So that's what we're actually going to be looking at. Um, He pretty much concludes that, yes, it is okay. You can eat meat that was, you know, you buy from the market and, you know, don't ask where it came from. Um, But if someone says this was sacrificed to idols, maybe you need to refrain so that you don't make somebody or a weaker brother or sister stumble. He tells you to do that for love's sake um, or for conscious sake. If someone says this was sacrificed to idols and, you know, for your own conscience, maybe you should say, okay, well, I'm not going to eat that. Um, but, you know, it's okay. You buy the meat without asking. If someone says a sacrifice, for love's sake and conscience sake, don't eat it. Don't partake. Um, and, you know, that principle applies to a lot of different areas in, in life, right? Because, uh, boy, we, uh, we find ourselves more and more finding things out about different businesses and it's like, well, I'm not going to go there and well, I'm not going to go there. Well, uh, they're doing this and I'm not going to eat there and I'm not going to buy clothes there and I'm not going to that hardware store. And, uh, you know, if, if, if we get to that point, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we, we live in this world. We're not of this world, right? Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to go to some particular establishment and you're riding in the car with, you know, a, a brother or sister and, and you're pulling into the parking lot and they say, you know, don't you know this place supports? Well, then maybe you should say, okay, we won't go there then. For love's sake, for conscience sake, you know? Or if it's something, that, a store that you need to buy something from and it's the only one that has it, I'll get it later, you know, for love's sake, for conscience sake. But, but I think that's what Paul's kind of getting at here. You know, it's okay, it, you know, to, 
I'm not, I'm not worshiping an idol by, you know, buying a particular tool at a particular store or, or, you know, buying a chicken sandwich from a particular restaurant, you know? So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's kind of what he's getting at. Just, you know, we're not, we're not worshiping them. Um, but we see that there's a, a bigger problem here. Um, but I want to, I want to start off and we're going to kind of break this down and go section by section. Oh my gosh, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. It's 730 already. <laughs> oh, it's 10 gallons worth for sure. Maybe it's 15 gallons. <laughs> Okay, chapter 10, verse 1 to 4 again. Uh, Moreover, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the, the cloud and passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate that same spiritual food. They all drank that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So he's using Israel as an example here. And the example that he's using is that you know, the, the Israelites, they were they were the chosen people, right? God chose them as a people. And, and as they're wandering through the universe, or universe, the wilderness, you know, you see my, my mind's getting ahead of myself. As they're wandering through the, the wilderness, they are uh, under God's protection. They're under his provision. He's providing for them. He's doing all these miraculous works. And, and it's like, oh, we're the Israelites. We're obviously special people and we're okay, right? We're okay with God. Um, Note that there's two primary provisions that are pointed out in this text. Uh, one, they pass through the Red Sea, which is a type of baptism, right? The second one is they ate the food and drink, a spiritual food and drink, which is communion. Uh, so the connection he is making is that the Israelites were blessed and they were provided for by Christ. And we too are you know, as represented by the two sacraments that are left to us through baptism and communion, we are blessed and we are provided for by Christ, right? We're really no different than them, okay? We're all under his provision and under his control. But the problem comes up when we go into verses 5 through 10. But most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. So here we see the problem unfolding. They thought they're God's chosen people, they're okay, right? but they're engaged in all these sinful behaviors. And because they think that they're under God's provision, which they are, um, and they're being blessed by God and everything he's providing for them, that he's indifferent to their sin. Is that right? I mean, that's what they're doing, correct? That's right. But is that correct for them to be doing that? Or in their thinking, is that a correct thinking? That's not a correct thought. God is not indifferent to their sin. Um, and therefore, their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Um, and then he says, so what happened to Israel, I should, Israel should be an example to us and a warning to not follow the same wrong thinking. All right, so why did they fall and what was the connection to the Corinthian church and basically the, the contemporary church of today? So how do we connect that with now? They lusted after evil things. Very clearly, we have a lot of evil things in this world that we lust after, right? They became idolaters. They said at Mount Sinai, we'll do all that God says. <laughs> Moses, go up there and tell us what God has to say. We'll do everything that God says. Moses goes up on the mountain and they're down there. Where's this Moses guy? What should we do? Hey, I got an idea. <laughs> How about y'all give me your gold and we'll see what happens. We'll just throw it in the fire and see what comes out. 
all right? So as Moses is up on the mountain, and they're down there, we'll do all that God says. What they're really doing is they're fashioning for themselves a golden calf, an idol, right? They're fashioning for themselves this idol. And then when they get the idol done, it comes out of the fire. And they got this golden calf. Who is the golden calf? This is our God who delivered us from the land of Egypt. Really? Really? That's how long it took? That's how long it took to, 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 to go from we'll do all that God said to this is our God. You know, he was up there how long? So somewhere less than 40 days, they couldn't even wait. You know, amazing, right? They fall right back into idolatry. That's in Exodus 32. Um, and then they fell to sexual immorality. Now, you remember in Numbers, they're wandering through the wilderness and they come to the plain of Moab and they're in the plain of Moab and, and the Midianite king, he's, he's terrified of these guys. He doesn't, he's, he's worried about the Israelites coming through there. And so he says, hey, I'm going to get this prophet of God and I'm going to have him curse them. And so he gets Balaam and he tries to get Balaam to curse them. Seven times he tries to get Balaam to curse them. And every time Balaam goes up there to curse them, what comes out? Blessings, 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 blessings come out. And, and, it's, and the cursing is not working. But then suddenly, if you turn to uh, Numbers 25 real quick, you're going to see something here. Numbers is, Pastor it likes to call it the book of murmurings, the book of complaining which is what they did a whole lot through there. 25. So this story of Balaam and Balak are in, is in Numbers 22 through 25. But when you get to um, 25, it talks about them in Moab. It says, uh, Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people... To, to sacrifice, I got some two different pages here. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. What was that, that verse I said? Log it? And they rose up to play, right? Sacrifice to their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against them. Now, take a few pages and take and go over to 31. So how did this come about? How did this happen? Because here they are, and... Um, Balak's trying to get Balaam to curse them. And every time he tries to curse them, the cursing won't come out. The cursing won't come out. The blessing comes out. The blessing comes out over and over and over. Seven times he blesses them instead of curses them. And so eventually now we find ourselves where they're in the plain of Moab and this is going on. And the anger of God was aroused against them. Balaam, I think it occurred to him that I can't curse them, but we can get them enticed. And if they fall for it, God will judge them. So that's what he was up to. And if you look in uh, 31, 16, it says, look, these women caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So that's what happened to them when they fell into sexual immorality. And that, that's a, I don't have time to go into this any further, but that's a very interesting story if you want to go back and read that. It's also interesting that um, Israel rose up in vengeance against Mid the Midianites 
And, uh, and they obviously won that, that battle. Um, but there's a particular person who dies in that battle. Guess who it was? Balaam. Yeah, Balaam ends up dying in that. Uh, probably rightfully so, I suppose. Uh, anyway, so connect this together. Let's connect these dots together. So here we are in Corinth, and Paul's admonishing them, and he's telling them to be careful of eating meats that are sacrificed to the, the pagan idols in the temple. Uh, who's the temple to? What's the temple? The temple of Aphrodite. Yeah, temple of Aphrodite, which is sexual immorality. So you see how this is all starting to come together? This is all starting to connect? So he's saying, be careful that you don't go into this temple and start eating the stuff that's being sacrificed to God or being sacrificed to idols. Maybe you might be there for a different reason or maybe we're getting a little too close, right? So he's connecting this to what happened to the Israelites. This is this, all the stuff happened for our examples. People keep on that, keep my mind. This wasn't just something for me to read and think, oh, that was an interesting story. He's saying this all happened to them and it happened to them for a reason. Take heed. Okay, that's what he's trying to tell them. The Corinthian temple was a temple to Aphrodite, a goddess of sexual pleasure. And the temple was occupied by hundreds of Moabitess prostitutes. So eating meat wasn't necessarily the problem. Joining a little too close to the temple was the problem. They sat down to eat and drink, and then they rise up to play. Right? Paul's saying, watch out. And the Corinthians apparently had a problem in this area because Paul addressed it previously in chapter 6 when he said flee from sexual immorality. So that was... That was another one. So that's three of them. And the, and the last one says, um, you know, don't tempt Christ and don't be complainers. That's in uh, Numbers 21 where they were complaining over and over and over. And, and God caused the serpents to come into the camp. And, uh, and, you know, many people were getting bit by the serpents and dying. And that's where he, you know, does this, the bronze staff with the, the serpent on it to stop the plague. So he's just admonishing them. Be careful of these things. And in that particular that one he spends a lot of time on is that sexual morality. Uh, and then let's go to chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. No, all these happen, all these things happen to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So as we learned in the Ephesians, um, we can't wear a fake breastplate of righteousness and expect to stand. You better take heed. Because if you're not taking heed to these things, you're going to get struck, and it's going to hit, and it's going to be a mortal wound. You're going to go down. Uh, he tells the Corinthians, and as he, as he tells us, if you think you stand, you better take heed, because you're probably going to fall. All right? And then, uh, verse 13... This is a very familiar verse probably to all of us. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation you will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And we all look at that verse, and most of us probably take that verse out of context and we, and we understand what it says. But in the context of what we're reading here, when he says, no temptation has overtaken you except as common to man, basically what he's saying is, you don't have an excuse. All right? That's what he's telling these people. He says, these are all the things that happen as an example, but you don't have, you can't say, well, oh my gosh, I was so tempted and it was right there. You know, I mean, my gosh, how am I supposed to battle against that? Right? What he's telling them right here is, this is, this is common to man. This isn't, this isn't something that just, you know, comes up and, and it's brand new to you and, and you're the only one that's ever experienced this. No, 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 no. You can't use this as an excuse. In fact, he says, it's common to man, but God is faithful. Yeah, God is faithful who will not allow you, note the word allow, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. It doesn't say God tempted them, only to an extent that they could be tempted or withstand that. He says, no, God doesn't, right? James tells us this, right? God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt. 
right? But each one is drawn away by his own evil desires. And when desire has given birth, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it produces death, right? So he's, he's saying, listen, God will only allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to withstand. He's not going to allow you to get tempted any further than that. Therefore, you can't say, I couldn't bear this temptation. No, you could have. Because God it says right here, God wouldn't have given you a temptation more than you could have, you could bear, right? You can't, he, I'm not going to give you anything more than you can bear. So if you fall to the temptation, guess what? It's because you wanted to. It's because you wanted to. You wanted to fall to that sin. That's the warning he's given them. God's not going to tempt you beyond what you can bear. But he will use that temptation as a way for you to escape it in the future. You just have to bear it. Realizing I think really, the really big point is realizing that if you fall to it, it's because you wanted to. It's because you made the deliberate decision to fall to it. That's a pretty scary thought when you think about that. I deliberately fell to it. Um, yeah, so temptation is not easy, but it is overcomable. Yeah, that was the note I wrote here. Um, there was one, one of the things I was reading, uh, there was a, a little analogy that was given, uh, where, uh, a man was running a, a, a little store, um, think of a little mix soda shop, country store, whatever. It's got candy and things like that in there. And this little boy, he walks into the store and he goes down to the candy aisle and he's, he's just looking at the candy, you know, and, and uh, and the, the shop owner notices him. And so he's kind of keeping an eye on this, this kid, you know, and the kid's standing there and he's looking, he's looking at all these different candies. And eventually, um, the, um, shop owner goes up to the child and he says, I think you want to take some candy. And the child says, no, 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 no. I'm trying not to. <laughs> so he's enduring the temptation. So I think you want to try to steal some candy. He says, no, I'm trying not to. So, <laughs> so um, let's continue on. So we'll pick it up back in verse 14. And we're going to go 14 to 22 here. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do you provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So the problem wasn't so much that they were eating or drinking, you know, that which was sacrificed to pagan gods. But how about eating and drinking in agreement with the pagan gods and the pagan sacrifices. I think that's what it is. It wasn't so much of what the substance was, it's where their heart was. And the two places that he uses the word communion, what is it's not the communion of the body of Christ, it's not the communion of the, of the blood of Christ, that's koinonia. That word there is koinonia. And we know that means like fellowship. You're drawing close. And, and if you remember when we were uh, last Sunday, when we looked at Psalm 1, right? You shall not walk in the path of sinners. And we said, that, or you shall not stand. Sorry, the word stand. <laughs> you shall not stand in the path of sinners. That we've said that was basically joining in like-mindedness with a sinner, right? So you should not have koinonia with a sinner. Same thing. You know, you're going to the temple, but you shouldn't be joining in koinonia with them. So you're, you're, and he basically says that, I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. It's the exact same word. He uses koinonia again. So are, is your koinonia going to be the fellowship of Christ? Is your koinonia going to be with the communion of the blood of, blood of Christ, the body of Christ? Or is your communion going to be with the demons? 
Are you really going to the temple to buy meat? Or are you going so that you can fellowship with them? You can sit down and eat with them. You're having koinonia with them. Because if you sit down and eat with them, eventually you're going to rise up and play with them. And that's why he said that. Be very, very careful of how close you get to something that can entice you and draw you in. Because eventually it will. It will draw you in. And he says, I don't want you to be fellowshipping with demons. I don't want you having koinonia with them. And don't you know you can't drink the cup of demons and the Lord? The cup of the Lord? Don't you know you can't eat from the table of demons and the table of the Lord? You can't have communion with both of them. You can have communion with one of them or the other. Paul says, whichever one you choose is going to be your master. Which one are you going to choose? I don't want you having communion with demons. They're mutually exclusive and they're incompatible. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, what communion does light have with darkness? It doesn't have any. And so his, he's using this whole example here to warn them. So yes, yes, we want to have the same blessings. We want to have this, the same provisions that God provided for us, provided for them. He, we want that same thing for ourselves, right? But the warning is there for both of them and us as well. Just watch out because it's so easy for us to fall into these temptations. It's so easy for us to complain. My gosh, we, you know, it seems like every year our, our verse, right? Philippians, oh my gosh, you know, don't do all things without murmuring and complaining, you know, so we may be the lights, right? And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, we usually get to about, I don't know, 1201 maybe. <laughs> but um, yeah, we can't have fellowship with both light and darkness. So, and then, you know, it's, I don't think any coincidence that when he, when you flip over to chapter 11, he talks about the Lord's Supper uh, because it's all connected, right? This is all, this is all a continuing thought that he's going through, da, 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 right on through. And when you get to um, chapter 11, he says, For I received from the Lord that which also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do as often, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then he says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Said otherwise, they were scattered in the wilderness. Their corpses were scattered in the wilderness. And that's what he's saying. So we are here tonight, and we're here to partake in the body and the blood of Christ. We're here to have communion with him, but we can't have communion with demons and the Lord. Can't have it both ways. And if we're going to insist on having our communion with the demons, we're bringing judgment on ourselves. And we don't want to do that, right? And so we want to take the rest of this time. I want a little bit, a little bit longer than I wanted to. Uh, we're going to take the rest of this time, and we're just going to, you know, you'll have a quiet time before the Lord, self-introspection, self-examination, cry out to the Lord, Lord, I, I don't want to have fellowship with whatever it is. I want to have fellowship with you, and I want to draw near to you. I want to be close to you, and I want to have that koinonia, koinonia with Christ, and I want to partake of all the blessings and the provisions that comes from my relationship with the Lord. Amen? All right, so let's bow our heads and our hearts. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your words. We thank you that you admonish us 
But Lord, you always draw us near because (laughs) I don't want to forget the text in all that we do, whether we eat or we drink, do it all to the glory of God. And Lord, we want to have this, this time where we can partake in the communion of the cup and the bread and the body and the blood, Lord, and we want to be able to do it to your glory. And Lord, we will glorify you as we allow you to work your life out into ours. Thank you, Jesus. Bless us now in your precious name. Amen.